Should a hockey team draft by positional need or by best player available? This is a tough question to answer because there are so many variables that go into play here that you can't really measure this. One of the externalities that's so difficult to measure here is the measure of the team's environmental impact on a player's development, since development in many cases outweighs natural born skill. A really good case of answering the positional need question though is the New York Islanders 2012 draft. That season, the Islanders finished with 34 wins, 37 losses, and 11 overtime losses good for 5th in the Atlantic Division, and they finished 27th out of 30 teams in the NHL in terms of goals against, so they struggled heavily that year. A very glaring hole that they needed to patch was on defense, since they were letting in about 3 goals per game on average. Their top 6 on D for most of the year was made up of Mark Streit, Travis Hamanick, Andrew McDonald, Milan Yersina, Steve Steos, and Mark Eaton. So like any other team, going into the draft they identified a positional need for the organization. Except in the 2012 entry draft, they tackled that need hard. They tackled it so hard in fact that they invested all 7 of their picks in that draft on D-men. Now a good precursor for a successful NHL draft is if you can find at least 2 or 3 NHL players in your crop of prospects. So using that benchmark of approximately 2 to 3 NHLers, let's see how the Isles did in the 2012 draft. At 4th overall in the first round, the Isles took Griffin Reinhardt, your prototypical big D-man. He was a guy that was intended to anchor the back end and be a big part of the core. But as it turns out, Reinhardt turned into an anchor of another kind. And he only ended up seeing 8 games of NHL time for the Isles where he registered 1 point. His NHL career up to this date has only seen him total 37 games played and 2 assists in that span. Next up on the menu, the Islanders took D-man Vili Poka 34th overall. Poco was your European skilled defenseman that you generally see as a little bit of a risk, but they have enough of a safety net to them where you can take them in the second round so it's not seen as much of a reach. Poco had a good size to him too, but he unfortunately never saw a second of NHL ice time and is now stuck in the KHL. The Isles 4th round pick Loic Leduc, their 5th round pick Doyle Summerby, their 6th round pick Jesse Graham, and their 7th round pick Jake Bischoff all played 0 NHL games combined to date as well. But out of this bunch, Jake Bischoff, the 7th round pick, probably has the best chance of still making it to the NHL. As he isn't doing too bad in the Vegas Golden Knights system, so we'll see on that front. The most successful pick for the Islanders in this draft came in the 3rd round at 65th overall. Adam Pellick is a guy that is now a regular for the Islanders on the back end, and he's had a career that's let him play 207 NHL games so far where he's totaled 51 points at this point in time. So if we look at this draft as a whole, out of 7 picks used on defensemen, the Islanders have only gotten 215 NHL games played out of it, and 52 NHL points, with only one of the guys listed having the right to be called a full-time NHLer. So by all means, we can call this draft by the Islanders a huge failure, especially if we look at the amount of resources that they spent on trying to fix their decor. Of course, Things like the scouting staff, development, coaching, attitude, and natural skill all play a huge part in all of this, but if we look at this draft in a vacuum of time, we can probably go ahead and say that maybe the Isles should have just gone ahead and picked the best players available instead. Unless of course, they actually did in fact pick the best players available in their own minds. Then that gets you really thinking. I hope you liked the video, and I'll see you in the next one.